alternatives, minority, oops, there we go, minority identity in the formative years of the Middle East. And the original idea of the project, which included three other scholars also located in the Netherlands, was to look at the role of Arabic as a federating force, um, roughly between 1920 and 1950. So meaning with the rise of Arab nationalism, the Arabic language was a way to get members of all of these emergent states. So we could talk about Palestine or Lebanon or Syria or Egypt and especially Iraq, how Arabic, which was religiously neutral, although we could sometimes say it's an Islamic language, but we can also say it's a Jewish language, how that gave people a common identity. And I was originally supposed to do a project where I looked at how Arabic played this role in um, the Jewish community of Iraq. And a wonderful book came out the month after I started my PhD that really answered that question. And I'm gonna to get to that in a moment. Um, but that's kind of how I shifted this idea to begin to think about, well, what role does Arabic play when people leave um, Iraq, right? And, and what role does it play? And you can think about it if you come from a background, you know, with Yiddish, how does Yiddish form an identity in the United States? Um, you can think about it with Jews from other Arabic speaking countries, but that's really what my research looked at. And one component was, was to see how language um, and different languages either were felt to kind of be Jewish languages, but also how they allowed Jews with origins in Iraq to feel part of different communities or cultural scapes or networks. Um, but I realized that some of the people listening here don't know much about Iraqi Jews. So perhaps a very quick refresher. Um, when we think about the Jewish community of what is today Iraq, um, there are other terms we hear sometimes Babylonian Jews, for example, because the Jewish community of Iraq is really the original um, diaspora community, right? The destruction of the temple, the settling, when we say by the waters of Babylon, we lay down and wept for Zion. This is what we're talking about, the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Um, it's where obviously the Babylonian Talmud was composed. It's traditionally an important center of Jewish learning. Um, and we even have Benjamin of Tudela in the 12th century visiting Iraq. Uh, well, what is today called Iraq, of course, um, and talking about the 40,000 Jews and 28 synagogues in the 12th century. Um, I think most scholars today would agree that he is exaggerating a bit. But why is this history so important? I think the history is important is because often when we talk about Jewish communities, even if they've lived in a place for centuries, they're seen as being an immigrant community or a certain type of other. And in Iraq, one special aspect of the community is that they're always seen as a historic community. They're not seen as a newly arrived community. And even though there is some good evidence that some Sephardic Jews may have arrived in the 15th and early 16th century in Iraq, they are brought into the community and you don't really see mention of a Sephardic community, whereas you would see something like this in a place like Syria, for example, where you have two, two communities, for example, or you would have in other places an Ashkenazi community and a Sephardic community. Um, and even when you have some Ashkenazi Jews who come to Baghdad in the 19th century, you have a period of a couple of years where they have a, a a special small Ashkenazi minyan. And even that gets brought into the larger um, Baghdadi community and it never really survives. And um, some of the great Iraqi intellectuals um, actually had you know, one Yiddish speaking Ashkenazi grandparent, but they were native speakers of Arabic. That was certainly their mother language. Um, and so it's a little kind of a different way about thinking how a community relates to a larger language. Uh, so what language are we talking about here and what does this, this mean? And um, for those who don't know much about Arabic, um, I'm, I'm going to explain that. And then for those of you who are a little bit more on the scholarly, scholarly side, I'm going to try to tie it slightly to uh, some recent literature on the subject. But Jews write in Judeo-Arabic historically. And what is Judeo-Arabic? Judeo-Arabic is the Arabic language written in Hebrew script. And it is very similar 
linguistically. Of course, there are differences to other Arabic written in Arabic script, but there are differences. And I think one of the main differences are loan words, right? Words that come from other languages. And what languages would those be? Well, historically, Hebrew and Aramaic, which isn't surprising. Now, that's a written language. And when we talk about Arabic, we often separate the written language from the spoken language. And the Jews in Iraq, historically, would speak their own local dialect called an Amiya. Um, and I think, let's say, academics today call it Judeo-Baghdadi. Um, but they would just basically call it our Arabic. Um, and other people in Iraq would call it the Arabic of the Jews. Now, this has kind of, this has kind of become a little bit, not politicized, although Ella Shohat and Semi Zubaida may have um, made some comments which politicize it a bit, but I think it's interesting to just kind of look at this Arabic. Um, so there are two linguists um, of the 20th century, Yaakov Mansour and Chaim Blanc, who looked at the Judeo-Baghdadi of Iraqi Jews. So this dialect, this spoken dialect, which is very different from written Arabic. And one main finding is that this is a very ancient form of Arabic, which was actually less corrupted than other forms of Arabic. And what other forms of Arabic are we talking about in Iraq? We're talking about Christian um, Baghdadi and Muslim Baghdadi. Um, so each community had its own languages. Now, how different were they? Um, I think we can have debates about this. And what I would argue is they were probably very different in the 19th century. And then by the 1950s, um, when the community for the most part immigrated to Israel, they were much more similar because the communities were mixing more and there was an influence on the language. Just as like in the United States, you see a difference in regional dialects that kind of diminishes due to television and radio, right, over time. But this is just kind of my own little theory on the matter with, with the different dialects of the religious communities in Iraq. What's really interesting about the Jews in Iraq with this Arabic is that in the 19th century, they were writing in Judeo-Arabic. In the 20th century, so that's right with the Hebrew script. In the 20th century, they transitioned to writing Arabic in Hebrew script. Um, and this is part of this idea of becoming Iraqis. And there are two wonderful scholars, Orit Bashkin and Aline Schlaffer, who have shown in their writings that actually Arabic in the case of Jews in Iraq really was the federating force of this new Iraqi pluralist identity. And so Iraqi Jews create Iraqi culture in the Arabic language, writing in an Arabic script, right? So this is not this Judeo-Arabic anymore. This is today the written form of MSA, of modern standard Arabic. Um, and that there's really no differentiation when you read this and you have Jewish newspapers in Iraq, which are written in modern standard Arabic. And you have some other examples in other Muslim countries of this, but Iraq is really the place where this flourishes. Now, what's interesting is, of course, there's this debate, and I think this is a debate in many areas of Jewish studies of, well, how integrated were the Jews? How much were they part of other Jewish communities? And both Ella Shohat and Sami Zubaida on different occasions have said, yes, well, actually, the differences in the spoken Arabic were overemphasized. Um, and this has been overemphasized to kind of diminish how integrated Jews were into Iraq. And again, I think that's something I really disagree with. Um, if you read in the archives, how people situate themselves, how they use language, it truly was different. But just as lots of people change the way they, they speak, certainly we know that men and women who were regular contact with non-Jews were very, um, were able to easily converse with Muslims and Christians. And similarly, actually non-Jews attend the Jewish schools in the late 19th and early 20th century. And that will also kind of affect this, this language perspective. Um, there's a wonderful book by Naeem Katan um, and where he talks about his youth in Iraq. And he talks about the day that he taught his friends, his Muslim friends and his Christian friends to speak with uh, Ju in Judeo-Baghdadi. And apparently they were able to get it pretty quickly, which would 
then demonstrate that the languages were quite similar. But of course, he's talking about the late 1930s and 1940s. And I think that's certainly the case. Um, but if you look at the work again of Jacob Monsor, he really shows that the lexicon, so the words that were used, the syntax, the ordering of the words, th these were really different. And of course, you have this influence of loan words from Hebrew, from Persian, um, also from Ottoman Turkish, and those aren't always the same with those other dialects. Uh, so that's kind of a little bit about uh, the ling linguistic terrain of Iraqi Jews. But my question, my research question was really, well, what happens when these Iraqi Jews, um, well, they become Iraqi citizens in the 1920s, um, but they usually refer to themselves as being Baghdadi, so very much situated on a city. What happens when they migrate to other places? Because beginning in the 19th century, or even before that in the 18th century, as my map shows, you have satellite communities of Baghdadi Jews, which are set up primarily in um, Bombay or Mumbai today, uh, Calcutta, Rangoon, Singapore, Jakarta, Shanghai. Um, and these communities take, have very close ties with Baghdad. And of course, this whole linguistic revolution where Jews stop writing in Judeo-Arabic in Baghdad is happening when you already have these Jewish communities in, um, on the Indian subcontinent and in East Asia, where there are other linguistic changes happening. And in parallel to this, of course, in Baghdad, you have first the Alliance Israelite Universelle coming in to build schools, so that's French, so you're adding another language. And then you have the influence of English, the British mandate and also through the Anglo Jewish Association. So Baghdadi Jews are inherently multilingual. And of course, the Jews who live in these satellite communities are also inherently multilingual. So you can ask this question, well, what happens to Arabic in the diaspora, right? How is Arabic seen? Where does it go? Um, and I think it's really interesting. Um, and again, if people are interested afterwards, what's great is you can also still get relatively easy access to the periodicals and you can kind of see how it was this very multilingual society, even if you're reading a periodical written in English. So in the 19th century, you have Judeo-Arabic periodicals flourishing on the Indian subcontinent, um, particularly para, if anyone kind of knows um, of these periodicals. And these periodicals are really published actually for Jews in Iraq because it's difficult to print newspapers in Iraq. Um, so these are very much proxy newspapers for the community. However, because these, they're small, um, these satellite communities, but maybe five, 6,000 Jews, sometimes only 500 or 1,000, um, are more and more in a colonial context, let's say in an English environment. Children go to school in English. And by the 20th century, we see that the Jewish periodicals in um, India and in East Asia are now written in English. So in the beginning, you have Judeo-Arabic periodicals in the 19th century for everybody. And then um, in the 20th century, you have periodicals published in Arabic, so Arabic, Arabic script in Iraq. And then in the satellite communities, you have periodicals published in English. And we know that the Jews in Iraq are actually reading these newspapers in English because they're sending letters to the author um, and correcting information and complaining and bringing up issues and it goes back and forth. Um, but then you can say, okay, so people are writing in one language, but what are they speaking and what are they writing privately? And the correspondence, the personal correspondence is very different. Um, and now I'm thinking about the first half of the 20th century, you see letters up until the 1940s written in Judeo-Arabic. So although Judeo-Arabic is now printed less perhaps, although it's still printed also for, for um, religious texts, uh, the Ben Ishai, for example, in the early 20th century, he writes in Judeo-Arabic for the Jews of the Indian subcontinent. He says the Hindustani women can, in Kanun al-Nisa. Al um, so some people are writing in Judeo-Arabic, but they're doing funny things with it now too. So in Hebrew letters, they're starting out and they're saying, my dear uncle, right? So like, mem yud, and they're going and they're writing in this phonetics with their English and they'll put words in French to, to be chic. And it's very difficult to read and I can only read it with the help of really skilled linguists. You have other people 
who are sometimes writing in Arabic, but we don't see Jews in the satellite communities learning to read and write Arabic, so much modern standard, except those who then return to Baghdad, because this migration is not unidirectional. People go back and forth. People open businesses, then they leave the business with um, a partner in India and they'll go back to Iraq. And a lot of what my book does is it reconstructs these networks to show how closely the satellite communities were when tied to Baghdad. And so that reinforces kind of this spoken Judeo-Baghdadi, which I see I spelled incorrectly in my PowerPoint. Um, and it also highlights these multilingual newspaper and these multilingual private correspondence. So you'll see sometimes one person will write in one language because it's the language they've been educated in, perhaps French. And then the person in the satellite communities has been educated in English and they'll respond in English. Or sometimes someone will write in Judeo-Arabic and they'll get a response in English or French. Um, you don't see people really writing in Hebrew or in modern standard Arabic between these two groups, except in official correspondence from the office of the chief rabbi. And that is written in Arabic going out to the diaspora community. And that's political because that's the office of the chief rabbi, which is being censored by the Iraqi government, showing that we are Iraqi citizens and this is our official language of correspondence. So because it's religious, you would expect them to be writing in very possibly in Hebrew or in Judeo-Arabic, but that's not the case. So they will send a letter in Arabic and then the teuda, the certificate for divorce or for marriage or for being Jewish, that will actually be in Hebrew. Um, but the language then kind of takes on this, this political role. Um, and there we kind of see some, some hierarchies, but also some questions about emotion with language because it, language is always emotional. Um, which I think are really interesting. So if you look at the differences between English and French, this is very pragmatic. In the 19th century, French is more important in Baghdad because of the role of the Alliance Israelite Universal in schools. And I think also partially the role of French within uh, diplomacy as a Western language. As the British empire expands and Iraq becomes part of the British Empire through the mandates and their important communities in India, in China, which are also part of the British Empire, English really becomes the central language. Um, and this is reflected in education, both in the satellite communities and also in Iraq, where it's important to speak Arabic, it's important to read and write Arabic if you're a man, because you're going to work somewhere where you'll need these languages. Similarly, English is very important. French takes a backseat um, in comparison to a place like North Africa, which is under French colonial rule. And we know Jews have a very different relationship with French in those areas, but it remains quite gendered. And it's still seen as being a prized language for women to speak. So even up until the late 1940s, girls attend Allianz schools. We are there learning French. Mm. So, and it's, what's also interesting, I would say, is you have some letters, which I came across of communal elites discussing where they're putting their children in school and um, kind of what they value. And they don't really talk about issues of citizenship or identity, right? Or like Israeli, like Zehut or something like that. Um, they're really talking about how my son can get a job and that's by having English and Arabic and how my daughter can find a good husband. And that's by being able to show that she speaks some French. Um, Hebrew and Arabic are slightly different. And I think what's interesting is that Arabic continues to carry religious connotations, particularly because of the role of Judeo-Arabic as a language of religious correspondence, a, a language that's used in responsa um, and Jews in the satellite communities finance the works of people like the Ben Ishai and Abdallah Somech, two very important Baghdadi rabbis. And those works are in Judeo-Arabic uh, predominantly. And interestingly, formal Arabic is not really taught in the satellite communities, but of course Hebrew is because of that religious connotation. Um, so the Arabic 
um, the written Arabic isn't considered important, but of course the spoken language is natural. And so it's assumed that children will kind of pick it up, but it's not, I've never come across, I'm sure there are, are examples which would, which would contradict what I'm saying, but I never came across any parents hiring Arabic tutors for their children, for example, outside of Iraq. That really wasn't seen as being a central concern. Um, so what happens with this Arabic? Um, with the generations who are born in places like India and Shanghai and Singapore. And I think this is where the work of Sarah um, becomes really interesting because she, you know, when she speaks about this idea of how you use a language to index your identity, because even Baghdadi Jews who might passively understand uh, some Judeo-Baghdadi, um, they know how to place certain terms in their speech to show that they're part of that community. And there are lots of terms, it's, and it's it's very difficult to kind of figure out what they are from written text because it's also spoken. Um, and I think you could still do this with some older people in the 80s and 90s who lived in India and Singapore and Shanghai, but you certainly see like place names. Um, and so, for example, a lot of Baghdadi Jews also in writing, they would call Jerusalem, so they wouldn't say Jerusalem, and they wouldn't say Al-Quds, they would call it Dar es Salaam, right? And so that's like city of peace, but that's coming from a different type of Arabic, and it's also literary, and it's how um, some Iraqi Jewish intellectuals would compare Jerusalem and Baghdad, uh, because Baghdad is also seen as a little Jerusalem, it's really seen as a permanence for these um, satellite communities. Um, you also see biblical figures, so Joseph or Yosef, um, he stays Yusuf, right? In And even you see this in English, holidays as well. Um, Shavuot is Eid al-Ziara, which you see written in English script. And then of course, food. Um, food really stays within the Arabic um, names, even when people speak English in their daily lives. And the role of Arabic, and I think Benny might speak a little bit more about this, is debated because at a time like the Passover Seder, you're supposed to recite the Seder in Hebrew or the mixture of Hebrew and Aramaic of the Seder, but you're also supposed to recite it in the language of your family or your community. And in um, Iraq, that was Arabic, but in the satellite communities, it becomes English. And there's this question of, well, should we do both Arabic to remember our roots and English? Should we just do Arabic, but the children won't understand everything? Or should we abandon the Arabic and go to the English? And you have these debates um, which go on and people are really thinking about this role of Arabic in the communities. I would also say what's kind of interesting is, you know, there are differences in um, what words people use in um, in Hebrew even, based on your community. So like, um, for example, at Rosh Hashanah, if you say Shana Tova or Shanim Rabot, like in certain contexts, and some of these terms, the Baghdadi Jews use the same terms as let's say general Sephardic communities. And you kind of see some discussions with this, well, the, our, our kind of Hebrew patching words are very similar. Uh, to those of the greater Sephardic world. And there are other much deeper discussions about this, about a Sephardic halachic ethos. But I think it's interesting as, pardon, Baghdadis begin to situate themselves within a larger Jewish world. And that's also what my, my greater book is about in the sense of how do the Baghdadi Jews situate themselves within, um, within a larger Jewish world, which is becoming more connected. And we I mean, were talking about this in the early 20th century before there's internet and WhatsApp and all of those things. Um, so to conclude, and then I think I've stuck to time, uh, a little bit of analysis and um, some things I found really interesting. Firstly, there's no stigmatization of Arabic in the satellite communities. And we can talk about in Israel, um, or maybe in like North African Jews in France, the idea that Arabic is a lesser language there's really never this sense um, of any stigmatization in the satellite communities. It's just a question of how much time is invested in Arabic and the role it has. Um, and I think that's just really interesting when we see what happens to Arabic um, in Israel after 1948. Uh, the second thing is the trajectory of Judeo-Baghdadi and how it kind of peters out. 
in some ways um, share some similarities with Yiddish. And what I mean by that is I would say the average Iraqi Jew um, or someone with Iraqi Jewish heritage today who's you know my age approaching 40, um, they probably don't speak Yiddish and they probably don't speak Judeo-Baghdadi, but they certainly know the words that their grandparents say right? And they certainly recognize it and they recognize it as being part of their culture. Um, we just maybe don't hear about it as much because it's a smaller group. Um, another thing which I found fascinating is the Baghdadis in the early 20th century were very, very much aware of what language to use when writing to different people. So whether you sign your letter at Rosh Hashanah Shanim Rabot or Shana Tova, um, you see this. And one of the greatest examples um, is um, David Sasson, who's an Iraqi Jew from England who wrote a book on Iraqi um, Jewish history. In his book, he's talking about like matseva and stones to memorialize people who, are, who, who have died. And he uses the term yard site to discuss this. And obviously yard site is never a term that you would find in Iraq. Um, it comes from Yiddish, uh, but they're aware of how they use this and they change um, the Jewish words they use in whatever language based on whether they're writing to Baghdadis or kind of pan Sephardic groups or traditionally Ashkenazi groups. Um, and you see this. And then finally, I think one thing that this research also showed me is that in the 20th century, when we look at international uh, kind of the international language of Jewish communication, it's very much English. And now I'm talking about people um, in Asia or in the Middle East writing to Jews in Europe, writing to Jews in North America. If Jews in Iraq didn't speak Yiddish, well, there, there were a couple of Yiddish speakers, but they were pretty limited for a population of 120,000. You can probably count them on both of my hands. Um, but if you were writing to Jews in Germany, you probably wouldn't try Hebrew first, you'd probably try English because you were more comfortable writing modern letters in English. And there were assumptions that even if the person receiving the letter couldn't understand English, they could much easier find someone to translate the English for them. And I think you really see this parallel kind of perhaps the decline of French as a language of diplomacy in some ways. My French husband is having a heart attack as I say this. Um, and the ascendancy is English as this language of Jewish correspondence. And I think that's something which also holds true to this day, although uh, the state of Israel would very much like Hebrew to be the international language of, of Jewish exchange, it still remains English. Uh, so I hope this little talk um, maybe interested you to read my book. Um, which kind of fleshes out these networks a bit more, not just from the linguistic perspective, but also um, from economic perspectives, from the perspective of philanthropy. Uh, but today I just, because this is the Jewish languages group, I really focused on the language side of things. So thank you so much. Wow, Sasha, that was, that was excellent. Uh, you just got at so many interesting issues and it's useful not only for the history of this particular community, but for really thinking about how Jews use language and how uh, ideology plays into which languages Jews choose to use and how they mix languages and mix elements of Hebrew, Aramaic and uh, various languages of their migration history, past and present. And, um, and so this was a, a really rich talk with a lot of interesting things for us to think about. So now we're going to turn to Benjamin Hari for a response. Thanks so much, uh, Sasha. This is a wonderful book. And uh, let, me, uh, let me share some notes that I have. Just... I loved reading it. I thought it's extremely useful, especially the use of language uh, in the Jewish, in the Iraqi Jewish communities. Um, of course, you're a historian, and maybe I should start. Um, I, I want to show a little bit uh, what you did in the book first, but maybe I should start with some comments on your um, on your talk. Just just few um, as a linguist, and maybe. Uh, offer some different terminology because of course you're a historian, we are linguists and we use different terminology. So 
Um, for example, you said that Arabic can be considered an Islamic language and also Jewish language. We shouldn't forget that it's also a Christian language. Many Christian communities can use and do use uh, Arabic. I've done some work in Tarshiha in Northern Israel where I see Christian Arabic, I, I see the connection between religion and language very clearly. Um, uh, you uh, talked about Judeo-Arabic differences, mostly loan words. We see various Judeo-Arabics where we have much more than just uh, loan words. Uh, for example, Baghdadi Jewish, Baghdadi Judeo-Arabic and Blank showed even the, the phonology, you know, the, the Gal versus Qal dialects, et cetera, et cetera. And you use the term less corrupted. I, I'm not sure I, I would use the word corrupt. I would use maybe, um, uh, less uh, developed or something like this, uh, uh, linguistically, more uh, uh, closer to uh, older forms, uh, something like that. Um, you use um, 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 uh, terms like um, they wrote in English letters. Well, these are actually Latin letters, no, not English. And I always tell my students, why are you so ethnocentric? Why is it English letter? It's not Spanish, it's not French. What's the matter with you? So anyway, these are, Latin, as you, we all know, these are uh, Latin letters. And um, what's interesting you said, and in your book you wrote, our Arabic versus the Arabic of uh, the Muslims. We have it in many uh, Judeo-Arabic communities. In Moroccan Judeo-Arabic, we have Il Arabi Dialna, our Arabic, as opposed to Il Arabi Dil Muslimin, the Arabic of the Muslims, exactly as you have it in, uh, in uh, a Baghdadi Judeo-Arabic. The questions of uh, differences are overemphasized for Zionist uh, reasons to show how separate um, uh, the Jews of Arab uh, uh, were, were of, of other communities. I, the issue is that it's very political and people who wrote it are historians, they're not linguists. This is our function as linguists to show the difference, to, to highlight the different dialects and the different... Uh, so I, I uh, yes, there are many differences and, um, uh, and yes, maybe there are inherent among some scholars, inherent inside non-conscious uh, desire to show that the Jews of um, Iraq are Jewish more than Iraqis. These debates uh, exist uh, even today about American Jews. So, uh, you know, I don't want to get into it, but we can if there are questions uh, and I can say something about it. So you talked about the uniqueness of Iraqi Jews and you talked about communal leadership, global Jewish solidarity, Baghdadi Jewish satellite, um, and you wonderfully showed how in the British mandate period it represents the height of Iraqi Jewish participation. And uh, let's see if I can move it. Uh -oh. Okay, good. So in, in, in uh, our recent book, uh, Sarah and I, um, uh, exactly as you took the um, the the glo the, uh, the the Baghdadi network into the global area. We took um, some Jewish languages into into general. We, I want to do the I want to put the Judeo Arabic in the general notion of Jewish languages. So um, so I I try to develop the notion of religious linguistics, the connection between language and religion, and I came up with the term religiolect, you know, which not everybody accepts, but it can be used. Uh, as a language variety with its own history and development used by religious community, um, parts of which may be later used by the majority under certain circumstances. It can, so to speak, come out to the general majority depends on, 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 on many uh, um, um, issues that can happen. So this is, you see where Judeo Arabic has developed, including India here on, on the right as uh, with uh, Baghdadi, uh, Baghdadi uh, uh, Judeo Arabic. And here I look very quickly at the history of Judeo Arabic and what I'm interested in. So you see, it's all the way from pre-Islamic uh, all the way to contemporary, which what you are talking about. What I'm interested in in this is to show the link between the, uh, so to speak, uh, ancient or medieval Judeo-Arabic all the way to today. And I can show a direct link. And this is what's uh, interesting. In medieval Judeo-Arabic, we talk in the classical Judeo-Arabic, we talk about three giants. We talk about Saadia Gaon, 
as you can see, with Kitab uh, al-Imanat wa al-Itikadat. We talk about Yehuda Halevi with Kuzari, and of course we talk about Maimonides. So I just want to show you that Baghdadi Judea Arabi doesn't come from nothing. It comes from this long history um, of course, the Cairo Geniza is extremely important, where many, many um, uh, leaves of, uh, written in Judeo-Arabic of the uh, uh, classical period uh, can be found. And um, late and modern Judeo-Arabic, and um, uh, you, of course, are talking mostly about contemporary Judeo-Arabic in your work. And look there, the development of regional dialect centers among Arabic-speaking Jews, one of them is Baghdadi. So here I, you already said, I looked up and I found a nice Haggadah and of course the, the debate that you were talking about uh, in the community, which we have in many other communities. Uh, I'm trying to move here around so I can, oops, uh, sorry, I have to go back. How do I go back? Here, no. Okay, good. So you see, Bimat Rayiret Hadi or Hadi Leila min min kili leyali fi kili leyali less nechna jamsin launu mara wahde Hadi Leila Martin. So you see, it's very uh, clear. I don't speak Baghdadi, so I, I'm not sure that my pronunciation is correct. But definitely, I, I you know, I'm working on on Egyptian Judeo Arabic, and of course, I can see Eishi Sabavit Rayeret Elel Hadi Min Gamil Ayali, etc., etc. So you have this in Egyptian. This is an example of uh, of Kairin uh, Judeo Arabic, and we have it from many other many other uh, translations of sacred texts. For example, this is the Book of Esther. Yeah, uh, this is the book of Esther. And here is the regional uh, Judeo-Arabic dialects, and you could see some of them that I list here, Libyan, Moroccan, Tunisian, Egyptian, and they're, um, uh, they're different from the dominant Arabic um, dialect in the area. It differs, differs with, with the linguistic distancing can be different, and it's not easy to measure, because what do you do? You give points for vocabulary, points for phonology, points for syntax. It's not that easy to measure, and um, many people will say, this is the closest, this is the farthest, but you know, how do we actually measure it? It's not uh, that easy. Here we have periodicals in Judea Arabic in modern time. Many of them are in uh, Baghdadi, and, um, uh, and I'm towards the end, so I'm finishing up. Um, most speakers moved, uh, of course, because of the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict, and, uh, and we still have sizable Jewish communities in North Africa. Uh, however, in Morocco, most speak French now. In uh, Tunisia, still uh, some Muslim, uh, some um, uh, a Judea, a Jewish uh, Tunisian is still, is still spoken. We have some issues with Judeo Arabic and Israel. Of course, the recent demotion of the Arabic language in Israeli basic law hurts Jews as well. Unfortunately, our appeal to the Supreme Court was just denied, and, uh, and Arabic has been uh, demoted in Israel. Um, but we still have some post vernacular activity. I think I should end here because I want uh, to hear some sort of uh, uh, discussion and questions from people so we can um, uh, both um, are able to ask. But thank you again for a wonderful book. Um, and please continue working on this, it's fascinating. Thank you so much, Benny. And uh, it's great that you contextualized the linguistic analysis of the study of Baghdadi Jewish diaspora within the broader context of Judeo-Arabic and the many Judeo-Arabics. So as people are thinking of questions and putting them in the Q&A, Sasha, I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond to what Benny said. So ben Benny, thank you so much for your comments and your linguistic perspective. And yes, obviously Latin script, not English. Yeah. And I just, it just goes to show that this is a revised version of my dissertation, full dissertation committee, including a linguist, and then, you know, peer reviewed by a press. And of course, no one said that. And yes, it should be Latin. So if there's a second edition, I'll change it. Um, and yeah, corrupted, of course, is a value judgment. And I agree with those things. I mean, I think the big question, which I find really fascinating, and this is because this question of language is very political when we talk about how integrated Jewish communities are, is how different was the spoken um, Judeo-Baghdadi in the late 19th 
early 20th century? And that's a really interesting question because my ears are not good enough, especially in Arabic, to even with you know the 1940s, there you know they're relatively similar. And I think it's because of this education, this further integration of the society. But when you read discussions about education in the late 19th century, there's a discussion for a push for girls to get more exposure to written Arabic and also to non-Jewish forms of spoken Arabic to give them more independence outside the home. And of course, these letters um, that I've read, perhaps um, they're uh, exaggerating the issue, but if they'll say, well, if you don't expose these girls, they're not going to be able to buy vegetables in the market. Um, and so I think that's really fascinating, um, but it also shows kind of the sociolinguistic side that as communities mix more, these linguistic differences definitely diminish. Um, and that's where we really see from a linguistic perspective, from my vantage point as a historian, uh, this intersection with language and identity, particularly in a context of Arab nationalism, because you have these documented, you know, religious dialects, um, religiolects, um, and you see how they change in the course of 50 years, which is not a tremendous amount of time. And I hope that um, linguists will look at this more, and I'd certainly be happy to collaborate with linguists from the historian perspective on that. Yes, Benny? Yeah, and I want to tie to the question that we have in the chat, I look at one, the first question, I, I, and I want, uh, is today Arabic a unique language of its own? And, um, uh, you know, uh, th there are two issues here. Uh, one issue is, of course, how different is uh, Baghdadi spoken from, from Muslim or, or Christian? I think Blank's work is essential, and he really shows the differences very, very, very clearly. So no doubt there, when we say also written, we have to be very careful because are we talking about written Judeo Arabic or are we talking about written Arabic? So um, uh, because Judeo Arabic can be written and also can be spoken. So, um, and the written Judeo Arabic is in Hebrew characters, the written um, Arabic is in Arabic characters. So we have to differentiate between uh, these two, but your, your comments of the vegetables in the market show the difference, the difference between uh, those two varieties. The question is Judeo Arabic a unique language. Now, you know, we don't really have a definition of language to start, to start with. And that's why we always, I always prefer to call Judeo Arabic a language variety or a religion. Like, and this is on a continuum, depends what kind of Judeo Arabic if you talk about the spoken. If you talk about Moroccan Judeo Arabic, yes. It's very different than Moroccan uh, uh, Muslim Arabic. If you talk about Egyptian, there are differences, but it's not that different. But again, how do you measure it? But definitely Judeo-Arabic is, um, uh, you can read about it. It's definitely a language variety that I call religious. -like. Some people will call it ethno -like. Some people will call it something else. Um, and it's the same about uh, the same uh, debate that you have on Jewish English and Judeo-Italian and you name it. So I think we kind of touched the first question. Um, so I see a question from uh, Joan Roland. And I should say, Joan, I'm a really big fan of your book and I cite it all over my book. Um, but your question is, did Baghdadi Jews in India move from Judeo-Baghdadi to English or did some learn Hindi? If so, was there a class difference? So I think this is a really good question. And I think this also kind of, I think this plays into class questions and also status questions. Um, ostensibly, all Baghdadis in India knew some Hindustani, Hindustani, or possibly something else. I'm trying to think in Calcutta if it's also Hindi, but yes, they learned local languages to speak with people who worked in their homes. Also, Jews who were involved in commerce, if they were buying textiles, they had to speak these languages. So they spoke them. Afterwards, I don't know if they wrote them, and I don't really see any references to people writing um, using Devanagari, for example, or other types of scripts, right? I didn't say Hindi, I said Devanagari, right? To be <laughs> correct. Um, so, so that's kind of um, so that's kind of an interesting question. I think Hindi was definitely placed at a lower level 
from a linguistic perspective, but certainly when you lived in a community, you would learn it through osmosis, but I don't, I didn't find any records of it being taught. Similarly, the satellite communities in Singapore and also in China, some people learn Chinese. And for the same reason, because of business, um, because of business connections, and also because most Jews, even poorer Jews, frankly, had some help at home. And this help was from the local communities. And to speak with those people, they would speak the languages, but or to buy vegetables in the market yet again. But the level um, of that language was certainly inferior to English, which really became the language of correspondence. Although I think that Judeo-Baghdadi as a spoken language in these communities lasts much longer than has been suggested by other people, but I only, I'm, I don't have enough material to prove this, right? It's kind of, it's a little bit fuzzy um, and it's a slow process. And as a follow up to that, Sasha, can you say a little more about the educational system? You mentioned the Alliance and the role of French in the education of Jews in these places, but what other information can you share with us about what languages they learned in school and what in, in what languages the instruction was? Yeah. So in Baghdad, um, and let's think about a population um, in the city of Baghdad of slightly under 100,000 people. In the 1930s, you have about 27, I think it's 27 Jewish schools and it, it will grow. And the schools all have different language profiles. And there's a whole chapter about this in my book with graphs actually, but you have religious schools. So a Talmud Torah type school, and they teach Hebrew, very rudimentary Hebrew actually, and then some Arabic, and those are for boys primarily. Then you have Allianz schools, which teach French and Arabic, because by the 1930s, this is mandated by the state, and a little bit of English. And then you have one fully English school called Shamash, which is the most prestigious school. These are big schools, right? Schools with a thousand students, 1500 students. So not, not small schools, which teaches English. And those students pass the Cambridge exams for English. And then you have, which is also quite interesting. You have public schools, which are actually public private um, partnerships between the Jewish community. So the Jewish community allows the schools to be there rent free. Most of the teachers are Jewish, having been trained in Jewish teachers colleges. And those students learn Arabic and they learn some English and some Hebrew instead of Islamic religious instruction. And in those cases, the Hebrew by the 1930s is very much framed as biblical Hebrew, not Zionist Hebrew. Um, so all of this to say, those who have means would put their children in a school that would usually favor English for boys or French for girls. Uh, but the default was certainly Arabic um, in terms of numbers and where middle class, where the middle class was educated. But what's interesting is the only fully free schools are the religious schools, which focus more on Hebrew, although the level is considered to be slightly poorer. Um, and those are run by the rabbinate. So there's some Arabic being taught, but then it's really biblical Hebrew, obviously Babylonian Talmud. Um, and, and so it's, it's really a mosaic of language. And students talk about a differentiation in language in the sense of there's a language in school and then there's our dialect at home. And an example of this is, again, speaking about, you know, these different types of Arabic and how well can you understand different types of Arabic. A girl going to school says, we had a Jewish teacher from Syria. For the first year, no one could understand the word she said. Everything was different. Now, I don't know, you know, these are the reflections of a grown woman about going to school when she was six or seven. So you never know what's true. But they were certainly aware of this and they were certainly aware of the changes in register in language when they would go to school. And you hear students talk about this. Um, a final note is, of course, students don't stay fixed in a particular school. So sometimes if parents had less means, they would have to pull them from one of the more elite English or French schools and put them in a public school. So students also got different language exposure in that way as well. Okay, we have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, I think I'll I'll start with one by Asaf Bar Moshe, who is a, a linguist, a scholar of 
Baghdadi Judeo-Arabic, and he writes, I have two remarks. One important term in relation to the Jewish Muslim linguistic relation is diglossia. The Jewish dialect was substantially different from the Muslim one in all of the, in all the linguistic levels, phonology, morphology, syntax, and lexicon. They belong to two different dialect groups. But most Jews were able to speak both because they were exposed to both. The Muslims, on the other hand, mostly could not speak the, I guess, the Jewish one and had trouble understanding it. Yeah. And then also the chart of Judeo-Arabic that Professor Hari showed is, is relevant for literary Judeo-Arabic. Colloquial Judeo-Arabic of Iraq has much more to do with Mesopotamian Arabic than with literal Judeo-Arabic, so it cannot be argued to continue it. And this relates to the question by, Benj by uh, Alexander Bader for Benjamin Hari. When you group different Judeo-Arabic dialects together, do you mean that, one, we can find some linguistic elements that all of them or many of them inherit from some proto-Judeo-Arabic, or two, do you simply mean that all of them are Jewish religiolects of mainly local Arab Arabic dialects? Benny? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll say if, uh, if you would say, Asaf is certainly right. Uh, um, uh, the issue that he mentions in remark number one connected to a majority minority relationship. That is usually the minority can speak the majority language, but the majority not necessarily can speak or understand the minority uh, language. And that's the case of uh, uh, Jewish uh, Baghdadi, and Jews could understand. Um, uh, Muslim and, by the way, also probably Christians, but the Muslims could not understand the Christians or uh, neither the Jews. That is definitely correct. Yes, the chart is literary, but it has some relationship uh, to to the spoken. Some, uh, so you're right. It's more uh, to it's more a uh, connected um, to the literary language. Uh, to Alexander, uh, yes, I mean that all of them are Jewish religious of mainly local Arabic dialects. That is correct, but there is also some elements that come from earlier Judeo-Arabic. There are some things that entered the language, like in every type um, of situation in Arabic, some elements entered from the, uh, from the so-called um, formal Arabic into the colloquial Arabic. I, I, the whole issue of diglossia, I, 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 I don't like the term, I call it continuo glossia because I believe in a continuum between the two edges. I don't think we have a pure amia and a pure fusha. I don't believe in that, it's all mixed, but that's a different issue. But it is true that number two is more correct, uh, it is um, a local, localized uh, Jewish religion, but there's sometimes some elements that come from, uh, from above, as you call it, Porto Judeo, big fine, from above. For example, in Saadi's translation, uh, he, termed, he coined some terms, and you see it used in some dialects later on. So you do have these influences, but in general, number two is more correct. Okay, Sasha, uh, Chaim Shainin writes, what happened to typical Semitic sounds like emphatics and gutturals when one of Baghdadi provenance switched to French or English? Uh, um, so <clears throat> you hear it and you, you hear the gutturals at least um, maintained. Um, I'm not sure exactly what emphatics are, I'm just gonna be honest, um, but if you, okay, so there's a rabbi, a body in the United States um, who's a Arab, native Arabic speaker. And if you hear him, you know, sing piyut, you can hear it. Um, and if you speak with older people now who speak um, French and English, you can hear that these sounds, um, certainly you can even hear them in, in English and French, which are the two, only two languages where I really feel capable to make that type of analysis. Although you can also hear it in, in Hebrew as well. Um, so, does it change? I don't know if you mean like when you're listening to them in English or French, you can definitely hear it. Does their Judeo Baghdadi then change because of the other linguistic profiles? I don't think so, but I really can't. I really can't say. Maybe I say one <laughs> quick word. Uh, emphatics are do and to. Oh, okay. And you definitely hear them in Hebrew. When yeah. Iraqi Jews speak, you can hear to, or you know, you could hear it. Uh, older Iraqis, yeah. Older. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we are just about out of time. I'll just ask, uh, Sasha, is there any last word you want to say before we say goodbye? Um, well, thank you for having me. This was, this was really lovely. I do see one question to the panelists. 
that maybe I can clarify, which was a question about um, the terms Sephardi or pan Sephardi and then Mizrahi and Baghdadi. So I use the term Baghdadi, which has to do with Jews whose origins relate to Baghdad or what is today Iraq. And they have their traditions, their linguistic profile. Now, prior to 1948, there, what I looked at is how they relate to other Jewish communities, how they see themselves within a mosaic of Judaism. And the proximity they felt was certainly to Jews who identified as Sephardi, having their origins in Spain, but also Arabic speakers who saw themselves as being Sephardi or other places like Halabis of the Arabic world. But the person asks then about the term Mizrahi. And that's a term that emerges in Israel, which you don't find prior to the creation of the state of Israel. And that's kind of lumping a bunch of identities together. So whereas I would never judge anybody by how they self-identify, right? Um, that's not really a term that anybody uses prior to 1948. So it's not a way that one could talk about um, Baghdadi Jews identifying with other groups, whereas they certainly make statements about how they see themselves within a larger Sephardi world. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, uh, the talk and the response and all the questions have really brought up such interesting issues here about Jewish languages and about the relationship between language and identity and language and migration and politics and um, religion and gender and social class and um, commerce. I mean, there, there just, there's so much richness here. Um, I just want to end by thanking you all for coming and telling you all about the, some upcoming events we have that are actually very relevant to this, because this Tuesday we have a wonderful talk and concert by Asher Shasho Levy about uh, liturgy in other languages besides Hebrew. And in this this particular session of this four session series, he is going to be talking mostly about Judeo-Arabic uh, as it is used in liturgy in the English speaking world, mostly in, in the United oh. States. So I hope that you'll all uh, join us for that. And I'll put the link in the chat so that you can find that and other events that we have coming up at the Jewish Language Project. And you will also get to see a recording of this event there. It, it should be up there. Um, in the next day or so. And also we are running a um, program called Fun Fact of the Day, where um, we are putting out um, some beautiful infographics. And I showed some of those as you were all entering the webinar um, about fun facts about Jewish languages. And uh, you're, you're welcome to see those on, the, on our Twitter feed, our Facebook page and, and other social media. And um, we, of course, will always welcome donations if you'd like to uh, express your gratitude for these wonderful programs that we're able to provide for you. And if you have ideas for programs or questions, you're always welcome to contact me. So thank you all. Thank you to our panelists and thank you all for coming today. Thank you. Thank you so much.